the word is someday. <laughs> Sopranos, here we go. Stand up, stand up, Altos. Come on, say peace and joy and happiness. No more sorrow. Someday, Altos, peace and joy and happiness. Yeah. Tenors, where are you? Tenors.
It is without question that we have been blessed by the matchless messianic master. In that he willingly and ably went to the cross of Calvary and died for the sins of the entire world. And for that we ought to be immeasurably grateful. And based on that testimony, Paul said, I am a debtor to the Greek and to the barbarian, to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am now ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so it is that Paul passed the baton to his son Timothy and told him, I charge thee, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom. Preach the word, be it sin in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and shall turn away from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departures at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but to all them that love is appearing. And so we have come to do nothing more and nothing less than to preach the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ and to tell it like it so of is. And we're grateful to see all of you here on tonight and we hope and pray that somebody is here that wants to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. We do not believe that the Bible contains the Word of God. We believe that the Bible is the Word of God. For the Bible says all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it is our hope and prayer that you will obey the Gospel before it is everlastingly too late. I'm certainly grateful to see all of you here on tonight. And I hope and pray that someone uh, that is visiting with us uh, will not leave here until you've put Christ on in baptism for the remission of your sins. We have certainly had a great time already and this meeting has already been a success on the basis of those who have already given their life to Jesus the Christ. I commend all of these brothers for, the jo for a job well done. Uh, they have certainly worked hard and diligently uh, to make this a success. And certainly we are absolutely grateful. Now of course I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew, the sixth chapter. That is the gospel according to Matthew. And we're going to begin reading at about verse 9. Matthew, the, ninth, the, the sixth chapter, beginning verse 9 and culminating at verse number 10. And from these passages, we will extrapolate our subject for tonight. Matthew, the, the sixth chapter, beginning in verse number nine. And this is what your Bible says. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. I want you to look at the A clause of this passage, verse number 10, thy kingdom come. I want to lift for a subject for a few moments on tonight. Has the kingdom come or are we still waiting? Has the kingdom come or are we still waiting? Now, of course, as you know, ever since Sunday, we have begun to operate and function under the theme, God's scheme of redemption. And we began this subject matter by looking at Luke chapter 24 
and there we taught from the subject, let's begin at the beginning. And we took you there into Jerusalem, and we tried to show you that if a man wants to be saved, he ought to do what they did at the beginning. And then, of course, on last night, we took you into the mind of God and showed you what was on God's mind before the foundation of the world. And we showed you that the church was on God's mind. For the Bible says, for whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his dear son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And then the Bible says, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Them that he called, them he justified. And them that he justified, them he also glorified. And we showed you what you saw last night was God's scheme of redemption from eternity to eternity. That is, we looked at what God planned in his mind, and Romans the 8th chapter gives you a synopsis of the entire scheme of redemption. But on tonight, we want to look at God's scheme of redemption from a different perspective. And that perspective is, we want to look at God's scheme in regards to the establishment of the kingdom of God. In God's scheme, God had planned to establish the kingdom. And I want you to know on tonight that if a man plans to be saved, he must be in the kingdom of God. If he is not in the kingdom of God, he will never go into the presence of God the Father. I would have you to understand on today that I am going to prove that God's kingdom was established on the first Pentecost after the resurrection. Now there are those who would take the position that God's kingdom had not been established. As a matter of fact, there are those who teach that the kingdom of God is going to be established at the second coming. I would suggest to you today that that's absolutely false doctrine. And not only is that false doctrine, I want to give you a proposition on tonight. Be it resolved that the Holy Bible teaches that the kingdom of God was established on the first Pentecost after the resurrection. And if a man wants to be saved, he's got to get in that kingdom. Now, not only am I going to prove that the kingdom was established on the first Pentecost after the resurrection, I also want you to understand that the kingdom is the church of Jesus Christ. I said the kingdom uh, is the church of Jesus Christ. And before this lesson is done, I want you to see the very same thing that puts you in the kingdom. That's exactly what puts you in the church. I said the same thing that puts you in the kingdom. That's exactly what puts you in the church because they're the exact same thing. Two different ways of describing the same entity. So I want you to know on tonight that God's kingdom has in fact been established. How do you know, Brother Haywood? Well, when we're talking about the word kingdom, the word kingdom describes the rule and the dominion of God. But in spe specifically, what we want to show is God's rule over the hearts of all believers. That's the kingdom of God that I'm talking about on today. And that kingdom has in fact been established and a man's got to get in the kingdom if he plans to be saved. Now if you're visiting with us on tonight, I want you to listen carefully because at the conclusion of this sermon, I want you to get in the kingdom of God. Because if you don't get in the kingdom, you are never going to be saved. Well, what is the kingdom? It is a Greek term, basileia, and it means the rule of God. When did God establish his rule over the hearts of all believers? Well, I want you to turn with me to Daniel chapter 2. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, uh, and I'm going to summarize this, of course. And uh, Daniel chapter 2, uh, I want you to meet me in verse 44 because I want to make an argument here in regards to when the kingdom of God has been established. Because it's been established, and, and we're in the kingdom of God. I said we're in the kingdom of God. There's no question about that. Uh, we are in that kingdom. We're not waiting for the kingdom. We're in the kingdom. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to deliver up the kingdom. Are y'all following me on today? He's not coming back to establish a kingdom. When he comes back, he's going to deliver up the kingdom. I'm going to prove that in just a minute. Now, uh, in the context of the book of Daniel, uh, from verse 31 through 35, I want you to understand King Nebuchadnezzar sees a vision of an image. Daniel the prophet is going to explain uh, this vision. And many of you know uh, that King, King Nebuchadnezzar in the vision represented the head of gold, which was the Babylonian 
kingdom. And then of course in this vision, he sees a head of gold, arms of silver, uh, the middle and thighs were bronze, and the feet were of iron mixed with clay. This was the vision that Nebuchadnezzar never changed as a saint. Daniel begins to interpret this vision. He says, oh king, you are the head of gold. But then there would be another kingdom that would arise after the Babylonian kingdom. This would be, praise God, the Grecian kingdom. And then the Medo, or rather, excuse me, the Medo-Persian kingdom, Grecian kingdom, and then there would be the Roman Empire. This is the vision that he sees. Now when he sees the vision and Daniel begins to interpret the vision, he actually sees four kingdoms. Babylonian kingdom, Medo-Persian kingdom, he sees the Roman Empire, the Grecian kingdom, and the Roman Empire. And then in verse 44, he says what? And in the days of these kings. Uh, in the days of these kings shall, shall the God, God of heaven do what? He's going to set up a kingdom. He shall never be destroyed. Now listen to me, church. Whenever a prophet gives a prophecy, the prophecy must come to pass according to the circumstances stated by the prophet. Otherwise, he's a false prophet. If the prophet gives circumstances in which this thing is going to happen, that thing has to happen according to the circumstances stated by the prophet. If it doesn't happen according to the circumstances stated by the prophet, then that person is a false prophet. Are y'all following me on today? So what we need to look for is what are the circumstances in which the kingdom of God is going to be established. Well, the circumstance is in the days of these kings. Are y'all following this so far? Now, in the days of these kings, it makes this prophecy what we would call a time prophecy. What do you mean a time prophecy? That means that the prophet establishes that this thing is going to happen at a specific period of time. Now listen to me carefully. If you take Daniel 2.44 and apply it to a time frame other than what the prophet stated, that's called an anachronistic interpretation. Now, anachronistic means you've taken the prophecy out of the time frame that the prophet said the thing is going to happen. So whenever you take a prophecy out of the time frame in which the prophet said it would happen, that is an anachronistic interpretation. Simply means you took the prophecy out of the time frame. Now, What's the time frame of this prophecy? In the days of these kings. Now, he just mentioned four kingdoms. Babylonian kingdom, uh, Medo-Persian kingdom, Grecian kingdom, Roman kingdom is the last one mentioned. He says the Roman kingdom, he doesn't call it the Roman kingdom, I'm going to prove it's the Roman kingdom. I know it's the Roman kingdom, I'm going to prove it in just a minute. He says they're mixed with iron and clay, which means the kingdom was partly weak, and partly strong. He says in the days of these kings. Well what kings was these kings? It would be during the kings that ruled in the Roman Empire. When the Roman Empire is ruling. It would be at that time that the kingdom of God was going to be established. Are y'all following me on today? It's got to happen at the time stated by the prophet. What's the time frame, Brother Haywood? In the days of these kings. Are y'all following me on today? But I got another time frame. Give me 2 Samuel 7. 2 Samuel 7 and verse number 12. I, I got another time frame. What are you doing, Brother Haywood? I need to find out when this kingdom is going to be established. Because if we, got, if we don't find out when the kingdom is going to be established, praise God, it's hard for me to tell you to get in the kingdom if the kingdom ain't here. So first I got to prove that the kingdom's here. Then you got to get in the kingdom that's here if you plan to go there. Are you following what I'm saying on tonight? All right. Well, you got to get in the kingdom. Watch the time frame. Second Samuel 7 verse 12 says what? Let your days be fulfilled. Let your days be fulfilled. I shall sleep with thy fathers. Time frame. David, when you are sleeping. Oh, Lord have mercy. While you are dead. What you gonna do, God? Read. I'm gonna set up thy seed after thee. I'm gonna set up your seed after thee. Read. We 
shall proceed out of thy bowels. Which shall proceed out of thy bowels. Establish his kingdom. Well, when you go establish the kingdom, he said, David, why you're sleeping? This is how I know the kingdom can't get established at the second coming. Because the kingdom got to get established while David, at the second coming, David will not be sleeping. Because the Bible says all that are in the ground will hear his voice and will come forward. That includes David. But the kingdom's got to get established while David is sleeping, which means the kingdom's not getting established at the second coming. It's getting established before the second coming. Are y'all following me on today? Because David has got to be sleeping. Well, let me keep reading that. He said, what is the house of my name? He's, okay, what, what if, praise God. Whatever the kingdom is, he now says it's a house. So the house is the kingdom, and the kingdom is the house. And it's going to get established while David is sleeping. But well, hold on. While David is sleeping, that's when the kingdom's going to get established. Well, it's not only going to get established while David's sleeping, it's going to get established in the days of these kings. Are y'all following me on the day? All right, well, so we know that there's going to be a kingdom and it's going to get established. Well, get, go back to Daniel 7. Get me Daniel 7. What you're doing, Brother Hey, when I'm connecting these dots. That's what I'm doing. I'm connecting the dots because I'm taking the position tonight. If a man's going to be saved, he got to get in the kingdom. He got to get in it. And I've come to tell, to tell you that kingdom's been established. Now, of course, I have some Jehovah Witness friends that don't believe that. Uh, and every time they come to my door, uh, they don't mark my house now. They don't come as much as they used to. Uh, but, but when they come, I, I tell them, come on in and let's have a conversation. And when they come in, uh, they told me the kingdom has not been established. And of course, uh, we disagree. And I'm going to tell you what I told them on tonight. Uh, except to say, uh, I told them we don't need to talk about the kingdom. We probably need to talk about you not as a whole witness. Because you ain't seen nothing and you ain't heard nothing. And since you ain't seen nothing or heard nothing, you can't be a witness of Jehovah. Because no man is, but that's a whole other thing. But that's a whole other thing. There ain't, there ain't no such thing as a Jehovah witness. You ain't seen nothing, praise God. But anyhow, Daniel 7, uh, verse 13 is what I want. Daniel 7 is what I want. What, what does it say? I saw in the night vision. I saw in the night vision. And behold. And this is a prophecy about the Messiah. Behold. One like the Son of Man. One like the Son of Man. Came with the clouds of heaven. Came in the clouds of heaven. And came to the Ancient of Days. Came to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near And they brought him near before him. Read. And there was given him there was dominion. Given him dominion. And glory. Glory. And a kingdom. And a kingdom. And all people. All people. Nations and nations. nations. Watch this prophecy. The Bible says, I saw in the night vision one like the Son of Man watching, coming to the Ancient of Days. Jesus, the Messiah, I'll prove it, is not seen in this verse as going to establish a kingdom. He's seen as coming to God and receiving a kingdom. Are y'all following this all today? So this prophecy cannot be in reference to Jesus' second coming. Because at the second coming, Jesus is not coming to establish anything. But in this prophecy, there is an event in which Jesus is going to be seen as going. Going to who? The Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days is God. So when we see Jesus go to God, when he gets there, he will receive a kingdom. Are y'all following this all today? What's going to happen, Brother Haywood? In the days of these kings, God's going to set up a kingdom. What's the other time frame? While David is sleeping. That's when all this stuff going to happen. Now let's cross the bridge. Give me Mark 1. Mark 1, verse 14 uh, and 15. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 uh, and 15. Mark 1, verse 14. You got it? All right. Uh, why don't you go to Luke 1, verse 31 and 32. Now, uh, uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 14, 15. Watch the text. Read. Now, after that John was put in prison. After John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee. Jesus came into Galilee. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. He's preaching what? The gospel of the kingdom of God. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Read it. And saying. What did he say? The time is fulfilled. The time. Well, what time was the 
time. In the days of these kings, Jesus happened to be living during the rule of the Roman Empire. Amen. Under the Roman Empire, Jesus now says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. at hand. Or the kingdom is near. Now Jesus said the time is right and the time has come for there to be a kingdom. He was living under the rule of the Roman Empire. Now Luke chapter 1, verse 31 and 32. What does that one say? And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb. Thou going to conceive in your womb. And bring forth a son. Bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Call his name Jesus. He shall be great. He shall be great. Shall be called the son of the highest. He shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him. Give unto him what? The throne of his father David. Give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house he of Jacob. He shall reign over the house of Jacob. Forever. Forever reign. Of his kingdom. Of his kingdom. There shall be no end. There shall be no end. They are expecting a kingdom to come with the son Jesus. Jesus stood up during the rule of the Roman Empire. And he said the time is full. Now, give me Mark 16, I mean Matthew 16. Matthew 16, y'all know this one, 18 and 19. Matthew 16, 18 and 19. And what? I, Read. And I say unto thee, Say unto thee what? That thou art Peter. Thou art Peter. And upon this rock, in the rock, I will build my church. Uh, yeah, read. And the gates of hell, read. Shall not prevail against me. And then what you gonna do, Jesus? I will give unto thee read. the keys of the kingdom. Well, of I know the church is the kingdom. And the kingdom is the church. That got to be right. I'm going to tell you, that got to be right. I'll tell you why that's right. He said, I'm going to establish the church and then give keys to the kingdom. Amen. Well, if he's going to establish the church and give keys to the kingdom, the kingdom keys must fit the church doors. <laughs> Otherwise, Peter is the greatest burglar in time. Yes. It's got to be the same way. The keys of the kingdom will give you that trench into the church. Upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give unto you the keys to the kingdom of give me Mark 9.1. Give me Mark 9.1. Mark 9.1. I can quote all of this, but Mark 9.1. Somebody here uh, may not have ever heard this before. So let's, let's make sure they understand. Read. Verily I say unto you, Verily I say unto there be you, some of them that stand here, some of them stand here, which will not taste of death, which will not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God, till you see the kingdom of God. God. What about this? It's hard to get around. It's hard to get around. Because Jesus said the folk that were standing with him would not die until they saw the kingdom come with power. Now if the kingdom didn't come, we got some mighty old folk walking around up here. I said the kingdom had to come. Uh, either Jesus didn't know what he was talking about, either Jesus was a lunatic, or Jesus told the truth. Now, I just believe Jesus told the truth. Some of you standing here will not die till you see the kingdom come with power. That means the kingdom would come in the generation of those living at that time. Are y'all following me on today? It ain't going to come at the second coming. It's going to come in the generation of those living at that time. Well, he said the kingdom is going to come with power. I'm going to summarize some of this because I'm going to run into some stuff I already said because it all meshes together. Kingdom is going to come with power. Power is going to bring the kingdom. Well, in Luke chapter 24 and verse number 49, the Bible said, Jesus told his apostles, you will be endured with power from on high. When they get the power, the kingdom is going to come. So I need to find out what's going to bring the power because the power is going to bring the kingdom. When you see the kingdom, it's because the power came. But the question is, what's going to bring the power? Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. Bible says, but ye shall receive power when the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus said the power is going to come with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is going to bring the power. Power is going to bring the kingdom. So when I see the Holy Spirit coming, I know the power is coming. When I see the power coming, I know the kingdom is coming. Because the kingdom's got to come with power. Uh -huh. And the Holy Ghost is going to bring the power. Well, in Acts chapter 2, we see the descending of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly, they came aside from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, filled all the hearts where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire set upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. I've come today to tell you, when the Holy Ghost came, the power came. Now the kingdom is about to be established. Well, the kingdom can't be established until Jesus gets some subjects. Well, in order to get the subjects, he had 
Colossians 1.13. Give me Colossians 1.13. Now the kingdom came. I know it came. I know it came because, now listen, the verse we started with said, thy kingdom come. You will never hear anybody say that prayer after Pentecost. Because the kingdom that was to come came. And there was no reason to say thy kingdom come. Are y'all following me on today? Well, Colossians 1.13. Colossians 1.13 says what? Who have delivered us yeah. from, from the power of darkness. From the power of darkness. And have translated has us. Has translated us. Into the kingdom of his dear son. Now how are you going to be translated into a kingdom if it ain't get established? Paul said we ain't waiting for it to come. I'm in it now. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Translated into the kingdom of his dear son. So that means every child of God who has obeyed the gospel is in the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom has been given. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 21. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 21. Now, now listen to me before you read. Question now is, if Jesus is not going to establish a kingdom at the second coming. What is he going to do with the kingdom when he comes? Here it is. Here it is. 1 Corinthians 15, 21. Read. For since by man came death, yeah. by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Read. For as in Adam all died, yeah. even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Yeah, read. And every man in his own order. Read. Christ the first fruits. Yeah. And afterward, they that are Christ yeah. at his coming. At his coming. That means Jesus is coming is going to resurrect his saints. All right? At his coming. Now read the next verse. Then coming the end. Now then coming the end. Now what you going to do at the end? Jesus read. And when he, shall, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God. Here's what he's going to do at the end. At the end, Jesus is not going to establish a kingdom. He's going to deliver of the kingdom to the Father. Are y'all following me on today? He's not going to come establish it. He's going to deliver it up to the Father. Now, if you plan to go up, you got to get in. If you don't get in, you ain't going up. Are y'all following me on today? Is that simple enough, praise God? I want to go up, well, get in. Because if you ain't in, you ain't going up. He's going to deliver up the kingdom to God. Every man's got to get the kingdom or he's not going up to God. He will never get to God's presence if he does not get in the kingdom of God. But I think I can do this. Get me John 3. I said I wasn't going to do it, but I'm going to do it. Get me John 3. I think I can do it. I think I can do it. I think I can do it. I was trying not to preach too long is what it was. But y'all all right? Okay. John 3. Verse 3. I, I, I think I can do this. John 3, verse 3. Now you know the kingdom's established. If you're visiting with us tonight, you know now that the kingdom's established. There is no kingdom going to be established. It's established right now. Jesus is not going to, Jesus uh, is not waiting to sit on the throne. He's sitting on the throne now. Are y'all following what I'm saying? I don't have time to go to Zechariah 6. I will show you that the Bible says he would sit and rule. That means when Jesus started sitting, he started ruling. Praise God. Are y'all following me on today? When he started sitting, he started ruling. Yes, sir. And now, now I, I, John 3, verse 3 says, What? Jesus answered and said unto him, What did he say? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except the man be born again, Except the man be born again, He cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, if a man is not born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, see, the word see here is uh, used harmoniously and synonymously with enter the kingdom. If you do, when we get to verse 5, you'll see exactly what I'm saying. See and enter. See is just the metaphor. Enter is the little. Are y'all following that? So he says, a man can't see the kingdom unless he's born again. All right? Now, go ahead and read. Nicodemus saith unto him, Read. How can a man be born again when he is old? Yeah. Can he enter into the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Yes, ridiculous. Read. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee. Verily, verily, I say unto thee. Except a man be born of water. Except a man. Uh, now, now, this is what I need to be. 
except a man be born of water and spirit. He cannot enter. We got to go to school, so let's slow down. Now, there are those who struggle with what is water in this text. Uh, I take the position, of course, that water here is water. Is what it is. But I need to be fair with those who are scholastic and those who are exegetically inclined. Uh, I want to be honest and clear with the passage. You must be born of water and the spirit. Now, what is water in the passage? There are those who would say it's natural childbirth, which would go with what Nicodemus was saying, can I enter again into my mother's womb? Uh, that's not true because what Jesus is going to do is explain to Nicodemus what's involved with the new birth. Now, he says you must be born of water and the spirit. Now, a word like water is what we would call a noun. Listen to me. Whenever a noun is preceded with an adjective or a definite article, then that means the word can be taken in a specific sense. Let me explain. That means if Jesus would have said, you must be born of the water, then water could mean something different from natural water. Because a definite article gives a noun specification. Or an adjective like Jesus used in John 4 when he said living water. Now, when you put an adjective in front of water, it changed the definition of water from what's natural to something that is metaphorical. Are y'all following that? So if water here does not mean water, there needs to be either a definite article or an adjective that changes the meaning of water from the natural sense. Are y'all seeing me on the day? Now, in John 3, there is no definite article before water. And there is no adjective before water. Therefore, water here is There is a preposition in the passage 
You must be born of water. Yes, now, in order for this to have two births, he would have to say you must be born of water and of the Spirit. Because the two prepositions would indicate two different births. But there is one preposition, and it modifies both nouns, which means it takes two nouns for one birth, because they're governed by one preposition. No problem, and that's a lot of school. I know that's a lot of school. What do you say, Brother Hayward? One birth takes two elements. What are the elements? Water and the Holy Spirit. And when I'm born of water and the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, I will enter into the kingdom of God. All right, I'm almost done. This is it. This is it, y'all. This is it. How, how, how do you know, Brother Hayward, that's baptism? How do you, how you going to prove that's baptism? I already showed this water, but you, how, how do you know it's baptism? Uh, give me 1 Peter 1 and Psalm 18, and we're about to. Put the nail in this coffin. How you know that ain't that ain't water? Well, first of all, it is water. The question we gotta answer now is: Is it part of baptism? That's what we're trying to answer. But we know it's natural water based on the ground. All right. Now, now, first Peter one. Let's do this quickly. Verse eighteen says what? For as much as you know, you are not redeemed with the blood of things, silver and gold, from the vain conversation, not the distance from your father. Read. Read. Wherein we were born. Read. Theis and made us 
and Elamite Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and as well as Macedonia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus. Pontus and Asia. <laughs> they are present on Pentecost. Peter wrote to those Christians and said, You have been born again. Folk from those regions were present on Pentecost from Pontus, Cappadocia, Asia. Peter said, some of y'all been born again. Now, how were they born again? In Acts 2, it says, now when they heard this, who heard it? Folk from Pontus, Cappadocia, Asia. Peter said, repent. Who did he tell to repent? Folk from Pontus. Peter said, repent and be baptized. Who got baptized? Somebody from Pontus, Cappadocia, Asia. Peter told him, repent and be baptized. And when he wrote to folk from their regions, he said, you have been born again. <laughs> Baptism was in the born again process. Which means a man is born of water and of the spirit and he enters into the kingdom of God. And first Peter, he wrote the folk from Pontus, Cappadocia, and Asia and he told them they were born again. And then the Bible in Acts 2 tells you exactly how they got born again and it culminated with water baptism. And it, that's all it takes for you to get in the kingdom of You ain't got to have a fit. Hurt yourself. Praise God. Give me Acts 8 12. Uh, how, what, how does a man respond to the preaching of the kingdom? I'll tell you. Acts 8 12. I tell you, it, pre, Brother Hamlet, you don't preach the kingdom. Now, what you want me to do? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you right now. Acts 8 12. Acts 8 12. What does it say? But when they believe Philip, when they be the things concerning the kingdom of God, uh, when they believe Philip, preaching the things. Preaching the faith concerning the kingdom of God. Read in the name of Jesus Christ. Whatever. They were baptized now. When you hear the preaching of the kingdom and you believe it, your response should be to get baptized. Are y'all following me on today? When they believe Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the authority of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. I've come today to tell you, it's just a matter of do you believe in the authority of Jesus Christ? I believe in the authority of Jesus Christ because every prophet pointed to him and said that he would come and this person would have all authority. I don't know about you, but pastor, so-called pastor, all not have more authority than Jesus. I don't know about you, but no jack led preacher ought to have more authority than Jesus Christ. The one who's got all authority is the man named Jesus. All the prophets pointed to him, apostles pointed back to him. I've come today to tell you that Jesus was the one that would come, that would have all authority. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. I will put in the teeth between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis chapter 49 and verse number 10. Set the shall not depart from Judah, neither the Lord give up from between his feet until Shiloh come. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse number 16. Behold, I lay a Zion for a foundation of stone, a tried stone, precious cornerstone. Sure foundation, he that believeth shall not make haste. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 1. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall go before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground, and hath the form of covenants. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men, man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, and we hid as if it was our face from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Bruised for our iniquity, chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. Micah chapter 5 and verse number 2. O Bethlehem and Freighter, though thou be little among the thousands, yet out of thee shall they come forth that is to be king in Israel, whose going forth is from everlasting to everlasting. I've come today to tell you, Jesus got all authority. I know he's got authority, because I can hear John the Baptist in Matthew the third chapter. In those days came John the Baptist. Preaching in the wilderness.
guarantee for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raven of camel's hair, and the leather and girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea, all the regions round about Jordan, and was baptized of him in Jordan on the first of their sin. But when he saw that the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who have brought you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. Then not to say within yourself that we have Abraham to our father. For God is able to be stones to raise up children under Abraham. Now also the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Every tree which bringeth forth a good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. He that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes are not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and the fire. Whose hand is in his hand, who will bear the bread of his cloak, and the devil will sweep into the dark, but the bread of the child with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus to John to be baptized of him. But John said, I've got need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becomes up to fulfill all righteousness. And he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, the heavens was opened unto him, and the Spirit descended like a dove, and the voice came out of heaven, saying, This is my beloved. In whom I will please. He's got all authority. He's my savior. He's my shelter. In time of the storm, I don't know about you, but I don't need nobody else. He's my bridge over troubled water. He's my shelter. In time of the storm, he's my friend that's sticking closer than a brother. I don't need to hear nobody else. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Jesus, just give me Jesus, because he's got all authority. So he's got all authority. He's got all authority. He's got all authority. He got all authority. I say he got all authority. I just wouldn't be in nobody else's church. Just the church that Jesus built. For he established his kingdom. Will deliver up. Okay. You want to go up? Get in. You don't get in. You ain't going up. I'm finished. Anybody got a question? I hate to preach all of that. It does not give you an opportunity to say. Preach, I got a question. Now, I'm, I'm finished yelling and hollering, <laughs> kicking my feet. Now, I'm just going to talk to you uh, normally because to do all that preaching and then you still leave unsaved yeah. is a tragedy. I just don't believe tonight after hearing about I see that hand there's a hand uh, you're visiting with us God bless you let's get her on my way we want to be respectful and polite because we love her and every other visitor we want folk to be saved Y'all see her standing? She's right there. If there's any question in reference to what I have said uh, about being saved, then we want to uh, give way. We will not embarrass you. Christians, be patient. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Hey. Um, I have a question. I got it everything else because you were going kind of fast. I was. I was trying I was. to keep up. Verse we went to. I want you to look at verse uh, 
22. And I want you to see how the Spirit works in the process of being born again. Now the text says, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. And then it says, through or by the Spirit. And then it goes on to say, uh, in the next verse, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. Do you see that? Okay. Now, the Holy Spirit, in the process of being born again, according to those two verses, it says we purify our souls in obeying the truth. You see that? And then it says through the Spirit. Now, the way you obey the truth through the Spirit, number one is the Spirit revealed the truth through the apostles. Okay? Now, I'm going to explain that. In John 16, 13, you don't have to turn there. You stay there. He'll read it for you. John 16, 13. I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit brings you and I the truth through the Holy Spirit, but it's by the apostles. The reason I know that is because of what I'm going to read now. In John 16, 13, it says what? Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Okay. In John 16, really starting in verse, uh, really starting in chapter 13, the context is dealing with the apostles. Jesus is about to go back to glory. He's going to resurrect from the dead. And then he promised, I'm going to bring you, I'm going to bring you the Holy Spirit. And he says in this verse, the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. Now, that's not you and me. Every you in the Bible is not you. And every you in the Bible is not me. We have to understand in the context who is the you. The you is the apostles, okay? Now, the reason that don't apply to you and me is because he says he would guide them in all truth. John 14 says he would bring it back to their remembrance. Now, ma'am, I can quote a lot of scripture, but I forget them too. If I had the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't even need my Bible. I wouldn't even, because I would be guided by the Holy Spirit. You follow me? And because that's miraculous. The Holy Spirit guides the apostles in all truth, in which they didn't do what we did. They didn't have to read it. They could speak it. Okay? So the apostles received the Holy Spirit for the purpose of bringing you and me the truth written down in the Word of God. Okay? Now, First Peter, they reveal the truth of the gospel. The apostles did. So the text says, seeing purified your soul and obeyed the truth through the spirit. What did the spirit do? The spirit brought the truth. Are you following that? All right. So the spirit brings the truth for you and me to obey. See, you purify your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit. That spirit brought the truth through the apostles. When I obey that truth, I am born again. You got that part? So that's how the Spirit works in the process. It's not something where the Holy Spirit talks to you and I. We obey that truth that the Holy Spirit gave to the apostles. And if you obey that truth, you can be assured that you're saved. Okay? So we don't have to wait for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. He already gave the truth recorded for you and me to obey. Yeah, does that make um, some sense? Good. So that's how the spirit works in the process. So we're born of water, which I showed in Acts 2, ends up being baptism. And the spirit is the one, or he is the one, who revealed the truth for me to obey. Is that so? Does that make sense? All right. You got another one? How you feeling? Huh? You fired up? say this to you, you can stay seated, but let me say this to you. Every, every, all, all of us in here love you very much, and I want to say, number one, thank you for your question. And then number two, I want to say to you, uh, it is my sincerest prayer that, that you embrace that truth tonight and, and be baptized. Because once you know what that truth is, you, you obey it, because we never know when God is going to call us. So it's so important 
to say yes to that truth even before you leave this building. If, if, you, if you believe and understand what I've preached from the word, I would beg you that when we sing this song of invitation, you just come down. And, and let me tell you something, this place will erupt when they see you come down. Because we love you that much. Is there anybody else that has a question at all? Anybody else? Christians, be patient. This is what we do. All right. All right. Uh, we have one more. Not members now. Not members. I, I don't see the hand. I just stand up whoever has that question. Okay. No question? No, she said she was a member. I'm sorry? She said she was a member. She said, okay, no. Uh, your preachers are here to answer your questions. <laughs> they, 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 they fired up to answer the questions too. Just go see them right there. Let's all stand. Before we start singing, before we start singing, let's all stand. Nobody, please don't, don't leave till we finish the invitation, please. The, these, these campaigns are supposed to be about souls. This is, this is said, I was just talking to Brother Osborne earlier, and, 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 and the only kind of events that I like doing are events that are purpose driven. This is purpose driven for saving souls. That puts me right up my alley. So let's respect uh, the invitation. Now, those of you who are not members, you're here visiting, you've heard the word, you've heard about this kingdom, you've heard about this church, and, and you've heard about this church that Jesus built. It's not a denomination, it's not some kind of fraternity, it's God's spiritual body, in which there is only one, and you need to get in that kingdom tonight. Now here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna sing the song of invitation. When we sing, this is our personal way of encouraging you to step forward. Because we love you so much. So when we're singing, it's our way of asking you to, to come forward and say yes to Jesus. So when you start hearing that song, you just come out these aisles and the person who brought you will walk with you. You don't have to walk by yourself. If somebody brought you, they'll walk with you. If nobody brought you, a member will still start walking with you. And when you come down, we're going to ask you one question. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And if you say yes, and you affirm that, we're going to baptize you tonight for remission of your sins. Uh, you, you, do, do, do I need clothes? Uh, we got clothes. You need, we, my, just got my hair did? Got caps. I know have you got your hair done. Back in Atlanta, we say did. You got your hair did? Got caps. All right? We've got qualified people who will, who will take care of you tonight and you can leave here with some joy. Okay. And let me say something to the members of the body. When folk get into church, don't kill their joy. Don't kill them. Don't start coming up with new rules that God never taught them. Let them have the joy of salvation. I want to tell you a quick story, quick story, quick story. I was preaching in Los Angeles in a, in, a, in a gospel meeting, and I was at a congregation, and I started preaching hard. One church, baptism is essential, going right down the line, and this guy on the front row started going, preach, preach. And I said, oh, that ain't no member. Let me, let me work a little hard here. That can't be a member. Too much joy for that to be a member. So I said, no, that ain't a member. And then I, I said, and, and praise God, uh, uh, if your church is not in the Bible, you got to come out of that church. Preach, preach. And the guy was just excited. And I said, what's well, something wrong? And I said, you got to go down in the water. Baptisms, prohibition of sin. Preach, preacher. And, and, and I, so I said, hey, man, I shot all my bullets. I ain't got nothing left. <laughs> I went to the back, closed out, and I went to the preacher. I said, listen, I, I don't know who that was, but uh, I, uh, I tried everything. He's shouting on the truth. I don't know what's going on. He said, oh, sir, I didn't tell you. We just baptized him and his whole congregation. He's a former Baptist preacher. And he can't stop shouting on the truth. 
Once he found the truth, he just got happy. Let me tell you something. When folk find truth, don't kill their happiness. They used to shout it a lot. Now they shout on the truth. Leave them alone. Let them have their job. They're washed in the blood. Don't let them kill their joy. That man was shouting on truth.
Oh.